Hey everyone, it's always good to be together. And today's a real tr special treat for us. Uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of hosting uh, Dr. Akio Palanisami. I know I butchered mm -hmm. the last name, but- No, I, you got it, you got I it. I tried, I tried. And uh, you know, I, I've known of him for some time. I've seen him a couple of times, most recently at the Commonwealth Club, and I have his book, which is the Paleo Vedic Diet. So Ayurveda with Paleolithic, Paleovedic Diet. And um, I'll call him Dr. Akio is the Department Chair of Integrative Medicine at Sutter Health Institute for Health and Healing. He lives in Sacramento, California. In this interactive program, Harvard-trained physician Dr. Akio will present the TIGER, T-I-G-E-R protocol based on the latest science and research. The protocol addresses five key drivers of autoimmune and all other chronic diseases. So I think that's really, really right on that the, we're all dealing with various kinds of triggers and uh, insults actually. And how we respond depends on our uniqueness and also what resources we have. Uh, we'll talk about toxins, gut microbiome and diet, and he will teach us holistic strategies, incorporating diet lifestyle supplement recommendation, uh, which will help optimize your immune system and reduce inflammation and help us feel better than ever before. So I think I'll let Dr. Akira take it away. Okay, well, that sounds great. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. B, for the yeah. invitation. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in today. It's great to be with all of you. Um, so I have a lot of information to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint screen so we can begin. And as um, Dr. B said, I, I'm, I'm going to be presenting about the TIGER protocol for autoimmune uh, disease. And for those who may not know, uh, autoimmune disease is where the body attacks it, uh, itself, and the body's immune system attacks different organs. There's over 100 types of autoimmune disease. Um, some of the most common are uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis. There's inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, skin diseases like psoriasis, eczema, there's um, celiac disease, which is gluten sensitivity. So there's a wide and very varied uh, presentation of autoimmune disease, but I'm going to argue that there are five root causes that contribute to all of them, and that ultimately all autoimmune disease is really one condition, which is immune system dysfunction. So the outline for today's <clears throat> talk is first, we're going to look a little bit of, at the science behind the TIGER protocol. And then, and then in the second part, we will look at the practical steps, how to implement, um, how to incorporate diet and therapeutic foods, um, how to make those concrete changes in your daily life. And then we will have some uh, Q&A. So the word TIGER is an acronym, which stands for these five root causes. Uh, T is toxins, I is infections, G refers to gut, like the gut microbiome, and we're going to be talking a lot about that. E refers to eating right, so incorporating uh, healing foods at every step of the journey. And then R encompasses rest, which covers sleep and also managing stress. So I always like to start with a case. Uh, this is a patient that I had seen in my practice. Um, Maria was a 40-year-old Hispanic woman who was dealing with um, psoriasis, which is an autoimmune skin disease, as well as a common triad of metabolic dysfunction, um, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, fatty liver, insulin resistance. These together are what are called metabolic syndrome, which is um, very uh, common now. And um, in addition to that, the psoriasis was what she came in to see me for, the autoimmune condition. So she was diagnosed with gestational diabetes after her first pregnancy, and then later on developed the metabolic syndrome of high blood pressure, insulin resistance, obesity, 
and then fatty liver as well. Um, so now uh, recent statistics are that about uh, 2 billion people worldwide um, have a fatty liver. So it's just really epidemic. Um, and she had high liver enzyme blood tests. You don't always see that in fatty liver, but in her case, uh, we did see that. And then um, even daily use of topical steroids, which is the conventional treatment for psoriasis, did not resolve her symptoms. So she was um, using the full you know, armamentarium of uh, Western medicine steroids that were pretty strong, but they were not really touching her psoriasis. So I always like to test the microbiome, which is all of the gut bacteria, even in a patient who does not have GI symptoms uh, like Maria. And we found that um, her microbiome was very disrupted, showing uh, high intestinal permeability, uh, um, high levels of a harmful bacteria over here. known as pseudomonas. Yeah, my husband. Um, oh, I it think someone is unmuted. <laughs> so smacking it. Mute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, low levels of bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, which are beneficial bacteria, as well as a um, important keystone species called acromantia. And she had low levels of butyrate as well, which is one of the short chain fatty acids that is uh, very important that we're going to talk about. So we'll come back to Maria's case. But first, I want to ask a poll question. So if you could just type this into, into the chat, um, I'd like it to be you know interactive. So approximately how many people in the US are affected by autoimmune disease? Is it A, 5 million, B, 10 million, C, 15 million, or D, 24 million? So um, go ahead and type your answer into the chat. And um, let me see uh, what the what the responses are. So we have a few different uh, answers, uh, B, C, D. Uh, so actually, Yelena had it right. It is D, 24 million. Um, so this is a um, number that's several years old based on the the, the most recent study, but it's probably much higher now. But um, it's, it's really very common. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, globally. There is really an epidemic with hundreds of millions of people worldwide now struggling with autoimmune disease. And the prevalence and cost of autoimmune disease are greater than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. And there's been a really rapid increase, uh, as you see on the left, 300% increase in some autoimmune diseases over the past 10 years. So clearly in that time, genes are not evolving uh, and this is environmental probably that is uh, causing this rapid increase um, to the point where one in five Americans now suffers from some form of autoimmune condition. Even irritable bowel syndrome has been studied to have an autoimmune component, which is the most common uh, digestive disorder. So I believe toxins are the missing piece of the puzzle. And let's talk about that in a bit more detail. So. The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, lists 86,000 compounds, of which 42,000 are in active use. And many of these have not been tested for safety, um, especially chronic low-level exposures, which is the norm for all of us with multiple toxins. Uh, some of them have been tested for acute toxicity, so they know what's the dose necessary to cause death or you know serious disease. But there's really no financial incentive for you know companies or anyone else to be studying the low level exposures over time which is what we are all experiencing so let's start with water um so waterborne toxins are pretty significant a government study found that 45 of the US states had perchlorate in the water system more than 50 million Americans uh, in a U.S. Department of Agriculture study were found to have drinking water potentially contaminated by pesticides and agricultural chemicals. And more than 40 million Americans, uh, actually, in their drinking water, there are pharmaceuticals such as antibiotics, hormonal drugs, um, other medicines that people flush down the toilet, um, and then they're not really removed or filtered by the municipal water um, processing plants because they're not set up for that. And so 
Um, and finally, 6 million people had very elevated PFAs, which is a, a one of these environmental toxins in the drinking water, uh, according to a Harvard study. And so I recommend getting a good uh, filter, like a reverse osmosis filter or a Berkey filter uh, for the house, um, or a good countertop filter, like you know Brita or uh, Zero, Z-E-R-O is another good option for countertop water filter. I do not recommend uh, getting bottled water because typically it's in plastic, and then you're going to be dealing with uh, what are called microplastics, which are uh, released from plastic. So better to have a, just a water filter for the tap um, and and make sure the water is uh, is really purified. So I want to highlight the second paragraph here, uh, which is by Dr. Douglas Kerr, who is a autoimmune disease researcher at Johns Hopkins University. Um, he said, most of the risk of autoimmunity comes from environmental exposures rather than from genetic susceptibilities. So that's what we're going to be talking about now, all of these environmental toxins and how they seem to play a much bigger role than genetics. Um, and then these um, same toxins that contribute to autoimmunity also contribute to obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease, three other epidemic conditions um, right now. So if you look on the left at the top, you see obesogens, which are basically toxins that promote obesity. They cause uh, metabolic disruption. Um, so I think that's actually a hidden cause of the obesity epidemic, which uh, um, no one has been able to really solve or you know figure out completely. Then there are uh, below that diabetogens, which promote diabetes. Uh, they cause insulin resistance. They cause blood sugar regulation issues. Um, another really big cause that's unknown and not recognized in diabetes. So. Um, and then we also have uh, cardiovascular disruptors, which contribute to heart disease, which is still the number one killer of men and women worldwide. So um, yeah, so the same toxins that drive autoimmune disease drive our other chronic diseases um, that are epidemic today. Now, I want to acknowledge that you may find this data overwhelming, um, but my goal is to empower you with this information. The goal is not to live a toxin-free life. You know, we can't live in a bubble, uh, but we don't have to. You don't have to completely avoid exposure to toxins, but you can enhance your detox capacity to effectively reduce levels of toxins, which we're going to talk about in part two. And the research confirms that this has um, significant power. So this published case was of a woman with rheumatoid arthritis who saw a complete resolution of symptoms after a year of chelation therapy, removed high levels of cadmium from her system. That's one of the heavy metals that is uh, implicated in autoimmune disease. So we'll come back to those um, detox strategies in part two, but let's continue going through the science. Um, so I is infections, and there are many different types. There are bacterial imbalance, there's mycobacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, so any type of microbe. And my approach with the TIGER protocol is um, to make the body inhospitable to infections and then allow the immune system to take care of it. So we're focusing more on the terrain, the inner environment of the body, rather than the germ and finding the right drug to kill the right germ, you know, which is more the Western medical model. Um, so that's my focus. And we'll, we'll talk in part two about how to make your body inhospitable to infections. G is gut, which is the foundation of your uh, immune health and overall health. So the microbiome contains uh, 40 trillion microbes from more than a thousand species. And uh, humans typically have about 40 trillion human cells. So we are 50% bacterial and 50% human. And we have about 23,000 human genes, but our gut bacteria have more than 1 million genes that can be expressed. And 60% of your immune system is actually located in the gut in uh, the uh, lymph tissue surrounding the gut. So most of your immune cells are in the GI tract. And then one condition which we're going to talk about is uh, increased intestinal permeability, which is also known as leaky gut. 
So some of the uh, classic gut findings in autoimmune disease are reduced diversity of the microbiome, um, dysbiosis, which we will cover in the next slide, and increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. So normal uh, intestine is supposed to have very low permeability where uh, it's like a brick wall that does not allow things to get across unless the cells um, choose to. Um, but then when you have leaky gut, you start to get holes where bricks are missing in the wall and things can get into the blood like bacteria or toxins or undigested food that then the immune system reacts to and makes antibodies and gets um, hyperactivated. And that is one of the hallmarks of um, autoimmune disease. So let's talk about this dysbiosis. Um, so on the upper left is a balanced gut microbiome where you have plenty of the beneficial bacteria and then the harmful bacteria are low and kept in check. And then if you go over to the right, you have an overgrowth of the opportunistic bacteria and then a decline in beneficial bacteria, um, which could occur from antibiotic use, uh, stress, um, lack of exercise, uh, diet with either high in sugar or high in bad fats, trans fats, so many causes. But then the consequences of that uh, dysbiosis are on the lower right of the screen. You have uh, increased gut permeability, so you have the leaky gut. You have uh, increased inflammation, both GI and systemically. There's more insulin resistance, weight gain, diabetes and metabolic conditions, fatty liver, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, heart disease. So just um, multiple consequences of this dysbiosis. And it's really the, it shows that the bacteria in your gut are responsible for, you know, every, um, they affect every organ system in the whole body. So just very, uh, very fundamental. And we're talking about these five causes as separate factors, just to explain them, but they do interact. So for example, microbiome interacts with toxins. So a study found that phthalate exposure, which is a common toxin from plastics, altered the microbiome in newborns, and in fact, changed their, their immune responses. Um, and then glyphosate, which is a common pesticide, was initially studied as an antibiotic. That was how it was brought to market actually originally. And it it's not a very good antibiotic because it um, targets the good bacteria and but does not kill any of the harmful bacteria. And um, so at low levels, you know, that we uh, I think it's disruptive to the microbiome. And that's one of the reasons choosing more organic when possible is important because that's uh, a way to um, lower glyphosate exposure. So let's talk about eating. Um, so I break it down into the phase one diet and the phase two diet. So the phase one diet is an elimination diet, which is designed to feed the microbiome. And during that time, you want to heal the gut. Uh, I recommend avoiding gluten, dairy, sugar, and certain other potential food sensitivities. So elimination diet, the phase one diet is short term and should be followed by an eight week reintroduction protocol that I outline in the book in detail, because in the long term, you want to have more diversity in the diet, because that translates to diversity in the microbiome um, and increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut will be addressed by the phase one diet as well, because of all the healing foods that are in this diet. One of the examples is uh, broccoli sprouts. So we all know cruciferous vegetables are very healthy. You know, they are cancer protective, they're anti-inflammatory. Those are the broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and all of those. But broccoli sprouts are actually the richest food source of sulforaphane. They might have a uh, hundred times as much as regular broccoli. And one trick to increase sulforaphane in cruciferous vegetables is to add mustard seed powder to them. Because you stupid a nigger! Son of a bunch. bitch, I hate niggers! And you are a nigger! You stupid nigger! Alright, I think, um, we're getting some... Mm. 
from Wojcik. Something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's always interesting when you do these these talks. Sorry, everyone. We just yeah. got Zoom bombed again, but I've oh. removed them. Hopefully, that <laughs> won't happen again. Apologies. Okay. Sounds good. No, it just that's good, Christina. Make sure everyone is awake. So that was that was perfect. So, um, yeah. So with the sulforaphane. If you add brown mustard powder to cooked broccoli, you actually get a 400% uh, increased absorption of sulforaphane. And why does sulforaphane matter? Well, more than 2,000 research studies have showed its benefits, including reducing inflammation, boosting the immune system in a positive way, not in an autoimmune way, uh, by increasing activity of natural killer cells. It's very good for brain function minimizes oxidative stress. Um, so research shows that patients with autoimmune disease tend to have high oxidative stress, which is a result of toxins. It's a result of normal metabolic processes in the body. So antioxidants are the solution to that. Um, and sulforaphane is one of the most powerful antioxidants you can get. So broccoli sprouts can be added in every um, phase of the diet, you know, both the phase one and the phase two. So let's talk a little bit about rest because understanding the role of stress is very important. Stress is a root cause for the initial occurrence of autoimmunity and also a driver of flare-ups and exacerbations of autoimmune illnesses. And research has shown that stress is involved in the development and progression of multiple autoimmune diseases like MS, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, autoimmune hepatitis, which is a liver disease, Graves disease. Um, so in my experience, almost all autoimmune diseases can be affected by stress, which is why it's such an important factor. And addressing stress does improve outcomes. So research consistently shows that taking steps to address stress improves outcomes in autoimmunity. So in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, the practice of mindfulness-based stress reduction over a six-month period led to 35% reduction in psychological distress and depression and improved parameters of well-being. So um, it's measurable, the effects of stress that are um, in autoimmunity. So we'll talk about now the practical steps, how to implement the TIGER protocol. With toxins, we will discuss detoxifying and improving liver function. We'll talk about uh, addressing infections, healing your gut and the oral microbiome. Uh, the oral microbiome refers to all of the um, 7 trillion or so bacteria in the mouth, which are also very important. And we'll focus on diet, uh, eating prebiotic foods, and the phase two diet, which is more my long-term diet. And finally, we'll discuss some tools for optimizing rest. Akio, I have a couple oh, of yes. questions. Okay. Sure. This is amazing. It's really clean, clear, and organized. One question came from one of our participants and said, uh, how do I go to my doctor, my primary care physician, and ask him to assess for autoimmunity uh, particularly in my child who who has some of these issues. So. Oh, great question. Yeah. Um, so if you suspect autoimmune issues, uh, there's a few basic blood tests you can request. Um, there's typically four that are part of the initial workup for autoimmune diseases. Um, those are a rheumatoid factor, um, ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, and then two markers of inflammation, the ESR and the C-reactive protein. Oh, so yeah. those are all conventional tests that are typically ordered if um, autoimmune disease is suspected. And how do you deal with the toxins? Is there a blood or urine test or other that can pick up some of these, the body burden? Oh, um, we don't have great tests for toxins. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the um, heavy metals can be assessed with a blood test, but most other environmental toxins, it's only possible really in research studies to measure them. So I think it's better to just focus on detoxification with all the strategies we're going to cover and, uh, you know, assume that we need to work on toxins. One more question. In terms mm -hmm. of the, the powerful foods you mentioned, uh, broccoli sprouts and mustard, brown mustard powder. Mm -hmm. What's the quantity? What's the size of how much sprouts and how much mustard in volume, not weight, would we mm -hmm. would we aim for? 
Oh, yeah. Great question. Um, yeah. So with broccoli sprouts, I think uh, you don't need a high dose because they're so high in sulforaphane. So I think about um, half a cup, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to start per day would probably be very beneficial. So um, half a cup of broccoli sprouts, or if you're using the mustard seed powder, remember that is not for broccoli sprouts, but that's for the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower. So in those cases, uh, I would think probably adding about one teaspoon uh, oh. should be sufficient. A, a whole teaspoon. That seems yeah. like a big, big amount of mustard, but we could try it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Doke. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so let's return to Maria, um, who was struggling with obesity, fatty liver, and psoriasis. Um, and in her case, yeah, I started her on the gut healing protocol with prebiotic foods and um, certain supplements. We used uh, capsules of neem, which is an Ayurvedic uh, herb from India that is very good for antimicrobial effect. Um, it, we, I was using it to help address the bacterial overgrowth we found in her stool test. And then some of the uh, red colored foods like red quinoa, red rice, pomegranate, cranberry, are especially good for raising up acromantia bacteria, which is um, one of the bacteria she was low in, and that is very important for blood sugar. So then after two months, we did repeat testing and found that her pseudomonas overgrowth had resolved. Um, her acromantia levels, which were very low, were now above average. Her keystone bacteria, which is the good bacteria, such as lactobacillus bifidobacterium, had improved. Um, her short chain fatty acids, uh, such as butyrate, these are metabolites that are supposed to be made by the gut bacteria, had increased significantly, and her intestinal permeability was normalizing. So um, her gut was really healing quite nicely. And then um, she found that previously ineffective weight loss strategies began to work because the gut bacteria play a big role in regulating weight and metabolism. Uh, she did lose some weight. Um, her blood sugar and blood pressure improved. Also, her abnormal liver enzymes returned to normal levels. Um, so probably her fatty liver was improving. And then finally, the psoriasis began to respond to the topical steroids that uh, reduced inflammation. So once we addressed all these drivers and root causes of inflammation, the anti-inflammatory medicines worked. And that is the uh, the beauty of integrative medicine combining you know, Eastern and Western approaches. So let's talk about how to detoxify. So first step is reducing toxin exposure. So opt for organic food whenever possible, um, filtering your drinking water, like we talked about, and then um, opening the windows at home is beneficial because um, indoor air can be a source of toxins. Dust in the home as well can carry them. So regularly dusting and vacuum. And then one tip is to uh, remove your shoes indoors and leave them by the, the door uh, because studies have found that the bottoms of shoes carry lead, pesticides, harmful bacteria uh, from picked up from outside. So better to not track them through the whole house. And then finally, um, declining receipts or choosing electronic receipts will reduce exposure to BPA, which is one of the um, environmental toxins that's hot, found in receipts. So cashiers who handle receipts all day um, are found to have higher levels of BPA in research studies. And there is great power in reducing toxin exposure, and it can be pretty rapid, the uh, changes that you see. So studies show that switching to a mostly organic diet lowered pesticide levels in the urine by 80% in just five days. Um, avoiding personal care products with phthalates, parabens, and triclosan lowered levels by 45% in just three days. Um, you want to make sure you're you're looking at your personal care products to make uh, find them as you know clean as possible. And then hand washing and removing dust in the home lowered flame retardants in the urine by 43% in just one week. So these changes can have pretty rapid uh, effects because the body's always trying to heal itself. And these are um, steps that are very beneficial. And when we talk about detoxifying, we also have to 
make sure we're not ignoring the pre-tox, which is what I call the steps before you detox that you need to be in place. One is hydration. So let's not forget drinking plenty of water is very important. Um, that's for the, how the kidney filters your, you know, your, your blood. Um, and then the liver packages most toxins into the bile, which then goes into the bowel movements for elimination. So if you're having a daily elimination, that's important because those toxins are being excreted as well. Um, and sweating is a very um, good way to detoxify as well. So research on people sweating in saunas has found that they uh, excrete measurable levels of lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, pesticides, flame retardants, BPA, phthalates, and PCBs, and probably others as well, because these are just the ones that were studied. And in one study, they compared sweating from a sauna to sweating induced by exercise and found that sauna use led to better excretion in the sweat for several toxins. So this was um, really interesting because we know, of course, exercise is so beneficial, which is, you know, a game changer, and that's great. Um, but sauna seems to have different mechanisms and appears better for detoxification. So I uh, advise my patients to incorporate both, you know, do regular exercise, but then try to sweat in the sauna at least twice a week for 30 minutes each time. Uh, build up to that, of course. And uh, you want to make sure you're drinking plenty of water, you know, stay hydrated, and also electrolyte. Uh, is important. So you can use those um, electrolyte mixes. And, uh, um, but I think a sauna is really underutilized as a therapeutic strategy. So with the infections, we're going to make your body environment inhospitable to pathogens. One of the ways to do that is um, optimizing the acidity of your intestine, uh, which is measured by something called pH because an acidic intestinal pH, which is optimal, actually limits the growth of the dysbiotic or harmful bacteria and yeast. That's one of the ways your immune system protects against this dysbiosis. And the biggest contributor to healthy pH is short chain fatty acids, uh, which are supposed to be made by the healthy bacteria. Also, fermented foods have organic acids, <clears throat> like lactic acid, acetic acid that are beneficial. So optimizing the acidity of the intestine is very important for addressing infections. <clears throat> and I like to use antimicrobial spices and herbs. So garlic is um, very powerful. And a tip about using garlic is to crush it and then wait 10 minutes for the active ingredients to be synthesized because the enzymes take about 10 minutes after crushing or mashing um, to work. And then you'll get a lot more of that uh, allicin and other active ingredients. So it's a lot more therapeutic that way. Um, and then black cumin is a spice that's pictured there. It's different from regular cumin. It's uh, quite black in color. Um, this is used a lot in Ayurveda. You can find it, find it in like Asian grocery stores. It's been shown to be beneficial in Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune thyroid disease. Black cumin is a broad spectrum antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory. So like most spices, it has multiple different benefits. And then finally, ajwain is a spice that stimulates the digestive fire. According to Ayurveda, this is a um, great spice to incorporate in the cooking as well. So that's another tip on how to uh, work on infections with the antimicrobial spices and herbs. Now, curcumin should not be ignored because turmeric is known for its anti-inflammatory effects, but is a surprisingly potent antimicrobial. Research shows it is antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. And the anti-inflammatory effects are well known. For example, study involving patients with uh, RA found that curcumin was as effective as the anti-inflammatory drug diclofenac at reducing pain and disease activity in RA. So not only does it reduce inflammation, but it's a very good antimicrobial. Now let's talk about the gut and how to heal the gut. So we need to address the dysbiosis. Um, we have to heal the leaky gut and also address the reduced diversity. So for the dysbiosis, uh, we want to reduce overgrowth of pathogens. We want to acidify the pH of the intestine like we, we talked about. 
Um, for the gut, our focus will be healing the increase in intestinal permeability or a leaky gut. And then eating right in my phase two diet is a way to boost the diversity because it's very high in prebiotic foods, which are foods that feed the gut bacteria. We're going to be talking about those in some detail. So some foods to help acidifying the intestinal pH to reverse dysbiosis and boost the beneficial bacteria. Um, bone broth, very healing for the gut. Uh, fermented foods are great as well. Prebiotic foods and fibers of different types. And then there are supplements as well that support gut healing, like glutamine, which is an amino acid that um, has good research for healing uh, the, any leaky gut. And colostrum, which is a dairy-derived supplement. So uh, if you're sensitive to dairy, you probably want to avoid it. But if not, a colostrum has significant gut healing properties as well. So it's possible to use combination of foods and uh, if you like supplements as well for gut healing. So the best way to increase production of these short chain fatty acids is a high fiber diet with a diverse blend of plenty of plant fibers. And that will be used by the good bacteria to produce short chain fatty acids and optimize the pH of the intestine, which is key for infections. Now for additional prebiotics, the options are either psyllium husk or um, something called partially hydrolyzed guar gum. And these can help with either constipation or diarrhea, but both fibers have the effect of increasing the production of short chain fatty acids and they acidify the intestine and lower its pH. So um, especially if you're, if you're dealing with GI issues, uh, one of these two prebiotics might be worth trying. So let's talk more about the prebiotic foods and the phase two diet. So at a high level, it is a nutrient-dense diet that includes prebiotic foods, fermented foods, increased plant diversity. And our ancestors over you know, a couple million years evolved eating up to 100 different plant foods every single week. And that's important because each plant food, which is unique, contains different types of micronutrients that each feed different types of bacteria in the microbiome. So that is key for diversity. So now, obviously, we can't go back to eating 100 different plant foods every week, but what is a good goal? Um, here's another poll question, if you can type it into the chat, your answer. Um, you should try to eat how many different plant foods every week? Uh, a, 5 to 10, B, 30 to 40, C, 15 to 25, or D, 20 to 30. So um, go ahead and type your answer into the chat. Let's see what the responses are. Okay, most people are answering D, um, which is close. Um, I think the, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, 20 to 30 is not bad, but actually I recommend B, the 30 to 40. And I see in the chat as well, there's a question about apple cider vinegar. Yes, that is a great way to acidify the gut. And um, by intestine, yes, I'm referring only to the colon because uh, that's what has been studied, the pH of the colon. And um, that's very important for the, um, the, P the intestinal immune system. So yeah, so with the phase two diet, I recommend trying to eat at least 30 to 40 different types of plant foods every week, including fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and spices. And even though that seems like a really big number, um, some tips to achieve it are um, if you use five different spices in a week, like turmeric, black pepper, ginger, garlic, and cumin or black cumin, that you can count them separately. So that's right there, you know, five or six different foods already. And then you can count different colored foods separately. So if you had a red apple, granny smith apple, and a golden delicious apple, that's three different plant foods. So using those kind of tricks, you can boost the diversity and aim for at least 30 to 40 uh, per week. And then prebiotic foods are some of the foods that are best supporting the microbiome. Um, and many of them contain polyphenols. So I've included a couple of tables from my book where I go through the 
polyphenol content, a lot of different categories of foods. This table is the polyphenol content in fruits. And so it's surprising that black elderberry is actually the richest food source of polyphenols, even more so than blueberry. And black currants are uh, close behind, which you would not think of as typically, you know, one of the healthiest uh, fruits, but it is one of the highest in it when in terms of polyphenols that feed your good bacteria. Another surprise comes when we're looking at nuts and seeds, because ground flax seeds we know are very high in polyphenols and omega-3s. But second is um, a chestnut, which we think of typically as a holiday food, you know, only consumed around uh, Thanksgiving. But I think that chestnuts actually deserve to be consumed year round because they are such a good source of these um, polyphenols that support the, the gut. So um, here's some examples of other prebiotic foods broken down by type of prebiotic, such as inulin, which is found in leeks and jicama. There are galacto-oligosaccharides found in black beans and Jerusalem artichoke. Resistant starch, there's three different types of resistant starch, such as uh, type one in millet and oats, uh, type two in plantains or green bananas, and type three in cooked and chilled potatoes. And then finally, arabinogalactins, such as radish and coconut, are excellent uh, as well. So there's uh, many, there's dozens of options for each of these fiber categories and uh, each of these prebiotics. So in the book, I give dozens of options and you don't have to eat all of them because just choosing a few foods that you like that you can add in will go a long way towards um, improving your microbiome. And then fermented foods also boost the diversity of the microbiome. So um, studies showed that six weeks of uh, eating more fermented foods in adults significantly reduced inflammation and actually improved uh, many markers of immune system uh, dysregulation in the body while enhancing the diversity of the microbiome. Um, and here, you know, they pictured uh, some of the foods on the right. So kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, of course, um, yogurt and kefir if you tolerate dairy, but um, any variety of fermented foods seems to really help reducing inflammation and um, boosting your microbiome and immune system. So let's talk about rest. Um, the uh, <clears throat> tools for optimizing rest, such as um, um, meditation, of course, uh, you know, is very powerful. But if you're not a fan of meditation, there's other options that work that have been proven in the literature to help, such as uh, psychotherapy, counseling, biofeedback, guided imagery, mindfulness practice, um, any type of meditation, deep breathing, uh, deep diaphragmatic breathing is great, as is hypnosis. So a review of part two. First, we're going to be uh, detoxifying and improving the function of the liver. Then we will address infections healing the gut and the oral microbiome. So just one tip about the oral microbiome, um, green tea contains a prebiotic that feeds those beneficial bacteria in the mouth. Um, and uh, so a simple way to get that is um, when you're drinking green tea, just swish it around your mouth before you swallow. And that will feed both the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome. Uh, especially rich source of um, polyphenols is the matcha, which is a type of green tea made from uh, powdered green leaves. So matcha powder or green tea is great for the oral microbiome. And then eating right with the um, prebiotic foods, especially and the phase two diet long term, and managing rest uh, with you know tools that that you find effective. So it's important to acknowledge that um, there are significant racial and ethnic disparities which need to be addressed. Um, so non-white women uh, develop lupus at a younger age, have more complications, and die from it earlier, uh, about 13 years younger on average compared to white women. So um, really significant differences. Same thing, minority populations with multiple sclerosis, other autoimmune diseases have poorer outcomes because of those social determinants of health that are really important. Same with autoimmune hepatitis as well. 
And uh, it is thought that one of the reasons for this is um, differential exposure to toxins. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Sadly true. this study found that Hispanic populations, both men and women, um, had higher exposures to cleaning chemicals, pesticides, and agricultural chemicals. So the racial and ethnic disparities could re partly result from toxin uh, differences. Also, uh, this has been studied in African-American populations, especially women, who might use hair straightening products or skin lightening creams, both of which were found to have high levels of toxins. This was reported in a paper um, pictured on the bottom there called the Environmental Injustice of Beauty. So I think that the, this is definitely a health disparities issue that we should not ignore, and we really need to take steps as a society to address these inequalities. So I'll stop there and take questions. Um, um, you know, there, for more reading, you can learn more from my book, The Tiger Protocol, and I've included 35 uh, recipes from my own kitchen there to because um, uh, I really believe in using food as medicine. And uh, uh, you can also connect with me through my website, drakil.com, or on social media at drakil, uh, D-O-C-T-O-R-A-K-I-L. So I'll um, stop sharing and happy to take any questions that are remaining. Phew, that was, that was a lot to take in. Yes, I know. It was great though, super great. So friends, uh, what did you hear? What did you learn? What do you wanna get clarification on? Please um, unmute yourself and speak directly to Dr. Akil. She said, thank you. Hi, I have a question. How are you? Hi, Great. good. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for this information. Mm -hmm. um, it's very helpful and just kind of incorporating this with other information that I have about food as medicine. Um, so in terms of autoimmune disease itself, um, what would be some first indicators for someone to look at, like to look for that might potentially um, trigger you to kind of speak with your primary care doctor that something's going on? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that um, then brings up this concept called the autoimmune spectrum, which um, is that autoimmune disease really occurs on a spectrum where in the beginning, it can be very mild, uh, nonspecific symptoms like fatigue, uh, joint pain, you know, uh, rashes, weight loss, brain fog, um, and um, research shows that autoimmune diseases are slow to develop. They develop over sometimes 10, 20, even 30 years, depending on the study. Um, and the very first sign of, of things is those autoimmune blood markers called autoantibodies, like the rheumatoid factor, the ANA, the, you know, any markers like that. So um, studies show, sometimes that shows up like 15, 20, 25 years before an autoimmune disease. So then, you know, you have time to start implementing all these preventative steps because the same steps that uh, help treat autoimmune disease also can help prevent it, like addressing toxins, uh, healing the gut or, you know, managing stress. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, with those, even the nonspecific symptoms, it's reasonable to request, um, you know, to talk to your doctor about that and, uh, and see if it's indicated to do some of those blood tests. Might add, you know, with kids is multiple food and chemical sensitivities. Because oh, yes. kids, kids yeah. are very, very reactive, very, you know, and they'll go, mm -hmm. oh, God, I ate that and I got a headache or I ate that and I got a stomach ache or Mm -hmm. I went into that space and it made me sick. And you yes. might say, what a hypochondriac. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's an autoimmune. The immune system is reacting to a, you know, a compound, which for others may be benign, but for them is, mm -hmm. is aggravating. And so the effect yes. will be inflammatory. Uh, and, you know, if it persists, mm -hmm. then it leads to some tissue damage somewhere along the, you know, through the whole system. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We do see a lot of food sensitivities in kids. Um, and then we also see them in adults too, you know, mm -hmm. like um, patients with autoimmune disease are more likely to have um, food sensitivities to gluten, dairy, uh, you know, common 
a lot of common foods like that. Um, I'm often asked about the nightshade vegetables like mm -hmm. tomato, potato, eggplant and stuff. Um, because there are some schools of thought that people should avoid them because of oxalates or other or lectins or other anti-nutrients um, that has become a very popular uh, kind of uh, diet or approach online. But I actually think that for, um, I do think nightshades should be tested through the elimination diet and reintroduction. But if a person doesn't feel worse or any new symptoms from reintroducing you know, the tomato, the eggplant, potatoes, and uh, nightshades, I don't think they're inflammatory in that case. And in fact, um, often those foods are associated with longevity, with health. Um, I don't think the problem of oxalates is really significant. Um, the one exception is if a person has had calcium oxalate kidney stones and uh, a urologist, you know, tests them and finds that oxalate is an issue, then yeah, they have to be careful with oxalates. But a lot of those um, other, you know, reasons to avoid oxalates, I don't think apply to most people. Good. Who else would like to ask a question or share a comment or a takeaway? Do you think people can do this on their own or is it advised to work with a health practitioner or mm -hmm. integrative doctor? Oh, yes. Um, so, you know, ideally, I think um, working with an integrative doctor is uh, um, probably the best case scenario, um, but not everyone has access to, you That's know, right. to that. Um, and so I do think a lot can be done on your own. And, uh, um, you know, I've tried to put a lot of detail into the book, you know, the recipes, the lifestyle changes, um, things like a sauna, which, uh, now many of my patients are, um, cause they are, they don't want to go to gyms because of COVID and the pandemic, but, um, they now have these portable saunas yeah. that you can get for the house, which are like a couple hundred dollars and, uh, you can, you know, use them at home, um, regularly. So, um, yeah, so I think a lot can be done on your own. Uh, if you're not able to access a integrative doctor. You know, the other thing is a group. It's nice to be in a group. It's nice to talk to other yes. people. It's nice to do simplifications and, and health mm -hmm. practices with a purpose and an intention and then go, wow, I, I took something away and I felt better or mm -hmm. something came in and I felt worse or, you know, just that much more awareness yes. and, and trying to stay out of harm's way with overstimulation, with over media, with over stress, over, yes, goals, you know, the, the, the glut of things. So, you know, cooling out mm -hmm. and going into a, a more quiet place and mm -hmm. really working on hydration to yes. make a difference. Um, I have a question with regard to mm -hmm. hydration. Um, mm -hmm. You had talked about using different kinds of filters to get, you know, the best water possible, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, this day and age, everybody's carrying around a container of some sort, uh, many of which mm -hmm. are plastic, especially mm -hmm. with regard to um, kids and sports. So for example, I have uh, several kids in sports and it's always in the heat of the sun. So they have their aluminum water bottles and they're a hundred degrees when they go to touch them. And mm -hmm. what, what do you recommend for transporting water? Obviously plastic is not an option. Yes. Um, I, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Because I think, uh, um, you know, ideally of course using stainless steel or glass is, uh, preferred, uh, but that's not always possible. Like glass is restricted in many situations, like with kids mm -hmm. in schools, often they, you know, can't bring in, um, glass, uh, and, uh, um, I think, um, you know, one option is there are, they do have insulated stainless steel bottles, which, mm -hmm. uh, keep the liquid a little bit cool inside, even mm -hmm. if the outside gets heated. Um, so that's an option in terms of um, if it's going to be out in the sun and, you know, um, but yeah, in general, I think stainless steel or, or glass are usually what I recommend for water. Okay. And how about for washing them? I have to admit, mm -hmm. you know, as a busy mom, I don't wash them every single day. And I'm, you mm -hmm. know, always kind of worried about the bacteria growth in them. Do you have any idea mm -hmm. like the speed at which bacteria grows, uh, that sort mm -hmm. of thing in water or water yeah. containers? <clears throat> yeah, um, I think, uh, I don't think it's necessary to 
wash them every single day. I think, um, you know, uh, I would definitely air them out because the problem when is when you're you're having water that's uh, sealed and, uh, you know, uh, the bottles are left overnight like that. I think that is yeah. where bacteria can grow. So at the end of every okay. day, I recommend emptying water bottles completely, letting them air dry overnight. And that's one of the biggest steps if you're not able to wash it, that is going to reduce the bacterial count in the, you know, in the bottles. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, you. you can also put some vinegar, cider vinegar mm -hmm. in, yes. the, in, you know, leave water in bottle and shake it up and pour it out later. And I drink a ton of green tea. So the mm -hmm. green tea does have mm -hmm. a nice natural disinfectant and having children okay. start to drink green tea and drink herbal teas is a huge yep. plus to get in there. Oh yeah, okay, good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. But, you know, if you smell it and taste it, you go, oh, this is bad. <laughs> yes. So you have yeah, to pay right. attention. And then at yeah. some point you go, oh, we we got to clean this baby up or put it in the put it through the mm -hmm. dishwasher on a high heat cycle. But the daily yeah. practice of emptying, rinsing, cleansing, airing, little drop or two of something uh, is nice. And make the kids aware of this, too. I mean, mm -hmm. our, our thing is we have to educate kids to know that yes things things can be helpful or harmful and they're the only ones who can really get that concept you know mm -hmm. yeah. before it gets yeah. too too far into them yeah yeah good point akio would you say allergies are kind of a garden variety form of autoimmunity oh yes um yeah i think um allergies um you know that's part of the kind of triad in medicine that we look at like eczema allergies, um, and asthma, they often go together. And uh, yeah, the research shows that, you know, they, it's basically an autoimmune or immune dysregulation component in all three of those conditions. So um, I definitely think, yeah, allergies are involved here. I see in the chat, everyone, if you would take a look at it, Christina has kindly shown, you know, asked for a little survey, how you like things. Uh, we will record this and share it with you. And also people who didn't make it, we always get a big sign up list and mm -hmm. a modest amount of people who come, but it's very special to be really present with Dr. Akil and each other. And also keep up. Uh, we have one in two weeks. It'll be really great and all kinds of things. Great. So I'm going to ask if there are any other questions, comments, uh, before we wrap up this 150th meeting of the Bowman Wellness Lunch and Learn Club. Wow, 150th. That's um, impressive. I just made it up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've had quite a few. I've mean, been going several years. <laughs> you know, but at oh, the Commonwealth funny. Club, that's what they always say. Yes. Right. So I, was, right. I was ripping on the Commonwealth Club. Oh, interesting. interesting. <laughs> Great. So yeah, you're paying and, attention. Um, that's very good. Yes. And thank you also for inviting me as well. Oh, it's a, so nice. And we'll have you back. And I really recommend the book. It's it's a beautiful book. It's well done. It's it's something you can look at over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have a problem to do this. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. You do not want an autoimmune condition to have to start considering this. These are these are daily health practices. Yeah, you know? preventative. Yeah. Prevention, prevent, yep. disease Absolutely. prevention and health promotion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's call it a Friday afternoon. And thanks, okay. everyone, for coming. We'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks so much, Dr. Akil. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. all right. Have a good day. You too. Take care. 